Good morning. Uh, well, we're going to watch it again. Um, <laughs> uh, real quick before I jump in, this is the last week of 9 and 1030. I've wore my 930, 11 o'clock shirt just for you yet again. And yes, I did wash it. Thank you, Neil, for reminding me to do that. But it is washed. Um, but this is the last week for that, and you guys know we're, we're just trying to create more space for people to, to come and experience Jesus, and um, through, through massive research, we found that for whatever reason, that half an hour difference uh, alleviates a lot of that tension. So we're, we're excited to do that this fall. So starting next Sunday, the 10th, 9.30 and 11. All right. We are uh, doing a one-off is what we call it. We're in between two series. Next week, we're doing a series called Full Sin, but today it's called Now Streaming. And this is a uh, combination of a bunch of stuff that we used to do in the past. We have done, if you've been with us for a while, you know that we've done things like listen to the music. Well, that uh, is where we take a, a top-charting Billboard song, and we, we listen to what the, the, the words are, and then we try to see what the culture is trying to tell us, and then we, of course, line that up with what Jesus tells us. And we've done series called uh, Watching Oscar, where we take movies that are nominated for Best Picture, we try to pick which one's going to be the winner, and we just talk about what's the message. And the reason we do that is because anytime something comes out, it's culture saying something. Now, we may not agree with what they're saying. It doesn't matter. It's still being said. So what we try to do is we take what is being said and we try to see what God is telling us as well, too. Now, um, this is when we do Nell streaming, or of course, we're doing a movie this week, but, uh, and it's Barbenheimer, in case you didn't know what, what we're doing. And you might like, I've never heard of Barbenheimer. That's fine, because I'll explain that in a second. But Barbenheimer was a cultural phenomenon this year. It was a cultural phenomenon because this is the first time in history that two blockbusters came out in the same weekend with one doing over 100 million, Barbie, and one doing at least 80 million, Oppenheimer. This had never happened before that two of those movies would do it at the same time. In fact, Oppenheimer is the highest grossing film to never be number one of all time. It's got its own dubious honor. Barbie is going to be the highest grossing Warner Brothers movie of all time, and they've already crossed the billion dollar sales mark worldwide. And of course, Oppenheimer is the highest grossing biopic ever. So these movies, which change the, the summer landscape, so different. You have Barbie and you have Robert Oppenheimer, a scientist, even more specific, a physicist. How in the world did these two movies come together to create this cultural phenomenon? Well, we're going to talk about that. And so Barbenheimer is the, uh, is the name that they created because of the entity that it became. And there's going to be some spoilers as we go through this. So if you haven't seen either movie, I'm going to ruin them for you. Sorry, that's, I don't know how to talk about it without talking about some of the conclusions that happen. But in the case of Oppenheimer, if you've read the history books, you know that he does, in fact, help create the atomic bomb. So that's not new news. That's, that was already in history. I'm not really spoiling anything, but as we talk about this, I want you guys to know I'm not endorsing either of these films. I'm not encouraging you to go see them. This is up to you guys. You guys are adults. If you want to see it, great. If you don't, it's up to you. I'm not endorsing it. All I'm saying is that there is something that the writers have, have put together, and they're trying to tell us in our culture. So we're going to listen to what's being said. Quick synopsis just to catch you guys up, because I'm sure not everyone has seen both movies, or maybe you've seen one or the other. I'm going to give you a synopsis on both so that we can have the same context. Barbie has the perfect life. That's kind of the, the start of things. She wakes up. She has the perfect arched feet. They go right into the shoes, and like all of these things happen. Everyone worships Barbie. The world revolves around Barbie. The Kens are kind of the accessory, and that's her life. But then her life starts falling apart during one particular moment when she questions if there's more to this life, like what happens if we die? And at that moment, the next day, her feet are now flat. She wakes up with flat feet. Her breath is bad. And she has other physical things that seem to begin to change in her. In order to fix what's broken, she has to go to the real world and find the girl that was playing with her and make things right because the girl essentially is losing her belief in Barbie, so she's losing her, her Barbie-like abilities. 
And when she goes to the real world and she takes Ken with her, well, actually Ken stows away in the back of the car without telling her, but she goes to the real world with Ken and notices right away that things are not perfect, that people don't just flock to her. They don't move out of the way when she needs to, to do something. They don't worship Barbie. In fact, it's the opposite. They don't even like her. And they push her physically and mentally. In Oppenheimer, here's this brilliant physicist, one of the greatest minds of his time. And he enlists the best minds that he can find that's not connected with the German Nazi empire, and they're trying to create the first atomic bomb, a weapon so powerful that they can use it to end World War II. And the problem is that the Nazis have been developing it a full year before they even get started. So you can kind of feel his own fear and, of course, the pride that he has knowing that he's one of the best minds in the country, and he lets people know it. And then eventually regret as he develops the means to which we can end the world. Two different movies. Two very different people. One of them, they want to find purpose, fame, and power. The other one, they dream of purpose, fame, and power. Both of them searching for the same thing. So four takeaways from Barbenheimer. That's just a fun word to say. I'm going to say it a bunch of times. First one, we want to live in an ideal world. It says in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, this is King Solomon saying, there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. Now again, we want to live in an ideal world. We want to feel like we are on the right path. We want to think the decisions that we made were the correct decisions. There are two parts in this movie. Two parts that I want to show you specifically. The first one, again, this is, I mentioned this earlier, it's Barbie questioning death. When this life ends, what happens? And when she has this question, everything starts to unravel. But it started with what happens next. And then in the next scene, because we can't, we can't show video clips because they're not out yet, but in Oppenheimer, this is a moment where he is celebrated for this, ma uh, this massive achievement. This is right after they had, they had test blown up the desert and it was going to work. And he gets this standing ovation because they just realize that they're a part of history, that this man did something that no one had ever been able to do. And they're praising him for it. But this moment won't last because just a few months later, he is persecuted for his own convictions. We want to live in an ideal world. We do. We don't want to admit that things aren't going well. I met this, uh, this guy. He was at the top. I met him when he was in high school, and he was at the top of his recruiting class in wrestling. He was just the best of the best. He was a, he was a light heavyweight, just maybe a possibly a middle heavyweight, but whatever he was, he, he won his state title as a, as, as a junior, senior, and, for, and a sophomore. He won um, best in the country at his weight. He would go to open meets where on Saturdays that weren't affiliated with high schools where anyone can compete from collegiate to Olympic level athletes and he would beat them all. He got so good that every college that had a wrestling program offered him a scholarship. He could go anywhere he wanted. And all of these colleges just, they were like, you, this is just a stepping stone, kid. You, you're going to come here. You're going to be all American. You're going to win state titles. You're going you're gonna to win all of the, the NCAA titles. Then you're going to be a, an amateur, and you're going to be in the Olympics, and then you can go pro. This is going to be fantastic. This is where it begins. Just make a decision. And when I talked to him, he told me, He's telling me all this, you know, like, I'm number one, this, this, and that. And he didn't do it, like, in a cocky way. He was very humble about it. But he said, um, you know, James, actually, I'm not, I'm not going to take any of these scholarships. And I said, why? What do you mean you're not taking these? This is a free opportunity. This is a free ticket for you. You could go to any college that has a wrestling program that you want, and then you could be in the Olympics one day. This is, a, this is an incredible opportunity. What do you mean you're not, you're not taking it? And he said, James... I've been wrestling since I was like four years old, five years old. And at every level, I've been the best. Even as a four or five-year-old, I was the best. I was always the quickest, the strongest. 
And he said, and then I moved on to, uh, I would get into some of the, the, the specialized select sports, and I was the best. And then I got into high school, and I was the best. James, I haven't lost in so long. But you know what? Every level that I was at, that I was the best, I thought that's what was going to make me feel good. I told myself, if I win state and I become the number one recruit in the country, that will make me feel good. And every single time, James, I just felt empty, like something was missing. But then, James, when I would go on these mission trips and I would go to Mexico and I would just play soccer with these kids or if I was at doing like a neighborhood vacation Bible school and I'm holding these babies, like I felt, I felt full. I felt like I was in the right place. And that told me, James, that I can't, I'm, I'm done with wrestling. I'm walking away from it. That did not bring the fullness that I thought it would by becoming great. That, it, that was not for me. What I want to do is I want to do what God wants me to do. And I believe that he wants me to be a missionary. So after high school, I'm, I'm going to join the missions field. And I remember just putting my hand on his shoulder, and it hurt a little bit because he was so muscular. And I was like, man, that's a huge blessing and a sacrifice that you're taking. And he's like, yeah, but I think it's going to be worth it. See, we chase the things in life that we think will make us happy. We think that it's going to fill us, that we'll be fulfilled, and that gives us purpose. And then we get these things, or we attain these things, and receive these things. They don't always f- seem to fill us. Why not? Could it be because we're chasing the wrong things? I want to share another verse with you from King Solomon. Just later in that chapter, whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress for their children. It will be a refuge. And then in verse 30, a heart at peace gives life to the body. Solomon is recognizing that there is more to this life than what you have or what you've achieved. Now this guy, he's the king. He has built this great, humongous temple for the Lord. He is in peacetime. He is super rich, super powerful. This guy is saying that a heart at peace, one that is focused on God, is what you should be looking for. And that's what he's saying. Because there's a problem with the ideal world. There's a problem. Is that we have to live in the real world. We want idealism, but we have to live in the realism. Jesus' words in verse 25 of chapter 6 of Matthew, I don't know why I said it like that, Matthew 6, 25. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or what about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? We have to live in the real world. We have to be clothed. We have to work. And this is a verse that is so fun to quote to other people. We don't want it quoted to us, because typically that means that we're struggling in an area. So we're struggling with our life or we're struggling with the relationship or our job or our health or whatever it is and we struggle and then people quote that to us and we're like, you shut up. I don't want to hear that. I want to worry. I want to know that I'm going to be okay. You leave me alone. We don't want to hear, hey, don't worry. Jesus says, don't worry. God's got this. Be strong. Have faith. Step forward. You won't be left alone. Those are all true, but we don't want to hear it when we're in the moment. When we're sitting in that tough part of life. In fact, we might even read that verse if we're sitting there alone and we just want to take like a black sharpie and just scratch it out and redact it, you know, like some kind of government document. Oh, God didn't really mean this. Let's just get it out of here. And we want to do that. I was thinking about the correlation where Barbie goes to the real world to fix her life in Barbie world because things were falling apart. So she goes to the real world and finds that it's even tougher. It's even more difficult. It has even more challenges and problems. Not everyone likes her. She can't get what she wants. And Oppenheimer, he's trying to save the world. He's got to beat the Nazis and, I, and I, I could see the pain because if the Nazis had developed this sooner, they probably would have won the war to have a weapon of this destructive nature. 
So Oppenheimer is creating an ideal world by use of power, but instead he puts fire in the hands of man. Living in the real world is tough. It's difficult and challenging. I remember my transition from high school to college, and I thought it was easy. It really wasn't that difficult. My meal times were set. My class schedule was set. My practice schedule was set. I had my roommates. I really didn't have to worry about anything but studying and showing up to things. That was it. But then I remember graduating from college and moving on into the real world, right? Every, uh, every graduation commencement address is we're going to spread our wings and fly into the real world and make our marks and we're all going to be presidents and astronauts, right? That's just like how it works. And I remember going to the real world and all of a sudden like our, our deadline came where you can, you can live in the apartments on campus through May because graduation was May 1st. So May 30th, you had to be out. So then by June 1st, we had to be in a place and my roommates and I were, well, let's go find a place. And we're going to these apartment complexes and they, they wanted a, an application, like a credit application. We're like, wow. And they wanted a deposit. And I said, a deposit? Don't you trust us? Why would you need a deposit? We're good people. We're Christians. But they require deposits because people don't always pay. I get that now. But back then, I thought it was a weird thing. Like, I have to give you extra money to live here? No, 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 no. That doesn't make sense. I had to get a job, which means I had to create a resume. And then I had to go on interviews. And I had to talk about, about the good things that I can do. I went to a few interviews where they were like, what are your greatest weaknesses? And I shared every one of them. And they were like, well, thank you for coming, like immediately. I was like, oh, I did that wrong. But I had to go on these interviews. I had to pay what was called utility bills. If I wanted electricity or, or heat, I had to pay people for that. And then when I did get a job and I started getting a paycheck, I would look at my paycheck and it was not the amount that I thought I was getting hired for. There was another company called FICA that was taking some of my money. Like 20%. I'm like, what? How dare they? That was the real world transition and sitting thinking about it now. Yeah, I was so naive. I was so ignorant. Of course, I didn't have the life experience. I was 21 years old, just trying to figure things out. And if I know then what I know now, obviously it wouldn't have been this like mind-blowing experience. It wouldn't have been new news. But at the time, it wasn't, I thought I was going to come out and it was just going to be a continuation and I'm just going to figure things out quickly. And it wasn't like that. There was a lot of stumbling. And there were a lot of difficult times, but there were also really full and amazing times. My friends got married and I got to be in weddings, and then they started having kids, and then I started helping with the church, and they, they, they called me into ministry, and I found what God wanted for me, and I got to experience that, and I got to meet my wife, and we had kids, and then a bunch of other stuff happened, and we planted a church in Washington. And there was a lot of stuff in between that that was both amazing and terrible, and everything else in between. Life wasn't perfect, and it wasn't guarded. And there were moments where I felt like my life blew up, which happens to be my next point. We have to live in the world, but then sometimes our world blows up. This picture of Oppenheimer is when they're hitting the button. There was a 1001% chance that it wasn't going to work and they were going to create the end of the world because the atomic explosion would continue in its, in its, uh, in its regularity, and then all of a sudden, all of life would have ceased to exist. That was a possibility. Very real. When they pushed the button, there was a chance that the world ends. But here they are, and they're, they're testing it, and it ended up working the way they thought it would work for the 99%. And if you look at the next picture, this is um, him in the inv investigation room. So he had this amazing achievement. He had ended World War II, but then because he started feeling guilty for what happened in Japan, he started speaking out against these kinds of weapons. So the government came after him and tried to discredit him. His life blew up. We wanna live in an ideal world. We have to live in the real world, but then sometimes our life just doesn't go the way that we think it should be going. Barbie 
goes back to her Barbie world after experiencing the real world. She goes back to her Barbie world. She fixes whatever she fixes with that little girl. She's like, wow, you're real. And she's like, yes, I am. And so she go back, goes back to the Barbie world and finds that Ken, who had already left, he experienced life where men got to, to make their own decisions and they got to be more than just the side accessory. And he was like, I'm taking this with me. So he goes back to Barbie world, creates a more man-centric Barbie world. And when she comes back, everything's switched. It's no longer revolving around the Barbies. Now it's revolving around the Kens. And she did not like that. Her world blew up again. And in Oppenheimer, he literally blows up two cities in Japan. Now, I know it's wartime. I understand that. I'm not saying that he did anything that was wrong in that time, but the result is still the same. Two cities completely destroyed in an instant because of this man's great achievement. And his heart is so grieved that he begins to push back on the further development of the atomic bomb. In fact, he tries to completely discredit and stop the development of the hydrogen bomb, which is going to be even more powerful. He speaks out against any kind of weapons of mass destruction. And because of that, the government, they don't want to hear that. They want these weapons, so they silence him. And his career and his personal life blows up. Sometimes life blows up. I want to share another verse, this time from King David, who knew a little about a little bit about his life blown up. It says in verse 107, I have suffered much. Preserve my life, Lord, according to your word. And then in verse 8, accept, Lord, the willing praise of my mouth and teach me your laws. When I say that sometimes our world blows up, you guys know this in theory and thought. There'll be times when things are going well, and there's other times when we're like, what in the world is happening right now? And when life blows up, how do you respond? David, holy cow, he blew up so many times. He had great achievements like slaying Goliath. And then immediately Saul wants him dead. Then he becomes king. And he messes up royally by taking the wife of one of his most trusted men. And then one of his sons tries to take over the crown and tries to kill David. David. David is constantly running back and forth, life not working out the way it wants. And then he's king again, and everyone's celebrating him. And then he's back to hiding in the caves. And what I love about it is every single time when his life blew up, he could have just been like, God, what in the heck? I am no longer going to follow you. He never says that. What he does is if you read through Scripture, you find him over and over again on his knees, praying, singing praises to God, worshiping, taking a posture of worship, even though his life is a swirling, whirling dervish of madness. Even in the caves, he's writing these amazing songs about how, God, I know that my life is being persecuted and my life is so hard, but you have got me. You're with me. And right now I'm struggling, but I know that you'll pull me through. And that's, just a, that's, that's a hard posture to take. I know. It's hard to do that when our life's not going well. I was listening to this podcast um, and the, the lady that was on it, her name is uh, Christina Kuzmik, and a really fascinating, fascinating lady. And she's famous for being a content creator. She makes hilarious where she pokes fun at herself of being a mom, of being a wife, um, all of these things. She's an author. But she was discovered by Oprah. Um, Oprah apparently discovers everything. But she discovered her back in 2011 when she was doing the next TV star search. And, of course, everyone nominates people, and she was nominated, and she won. And I think the reason why she was so popular was because the content that she was creating really kind of made fun of, not to say made fun of, but brought to light the difficulties of life, of managing life every day. And she would create all these different vignettes and videos, but her life literally blew up. She immigrated from Croatia during the wartime, and she would often talk about how her neighborhood was bombed. And she literally had her hometown blown up. When we say figuratively, oh, my life blew up, she can say literally, yeah, I know, that's happened to me. 
And she was sharing this story of how she kind of, kind of jumped into this content creation and why she is the way she is now. And after she had immigrated over from Croatia, she, she kind of grew up in the States and then met a young man and they got married and had two kids. And as a young mom, uh, he decided he's just gone. He, he just leaves. He says, I don't want to do this anymore. So now single mom, two young kids, massively depressed. And she's sitting on the floor of her kitchen just just weeping and wondering, why am I here? Life would be better if I was gone. See, when life blows up, it's those dark thoughts and moments that creep in. And you start thinking those kinds of thoughts. Is there a way to stop that? I believe there is. I believe that God gives us a different way to see the world. It says in Matthew 6.33, this is Jesus' words, but seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all things will be given to you as well. See, God gives us a different way to see the world. This is a direct response that, that Jesus just said a few verses before. Don't worry. God has got this thing figured out for you. And then he goes on this whole just poetic explanation. The birds, they're taken care of. The flowers in the field, they're taken care of. If he takes care of them, he loves you so much more. Why wouldn't he take care of you even more? And he goes on this huge just kind of explanation of why God is not going to leave us. And then he says right here, if you want that peace, though, seek first the kingdom. Peace comes from seeking God, Jesus' words. There's a scene in Barbie where Barbie meets Ruth Handler. If you don't know who that is, she uh, is the creator of Barbie. And she gets a chance to meet her and talk to her. What would that be like to talk to your creator? Wouldn't that be amazing? See, God gives us a different way to see the world. And in that moment, her talk with her creator, she had this profound quote. And the quote was, I want to be a part of the people that make meaning, not the thing that is made. So in that moment, Barbie decides to leave Barbie world and live in the real world, even though it's harder, even though it's more difficult, even though not everyone likes her, she wanted to live in the real world because that's where the purpose was. That's the meaning. She wanted to be a part of those that are the creators, not the ones that are made. I was like, wow, that's a pretty profound quote for a Barbie movie. But see, God gives us a different way to see life. And we can find our value and purpose by seeking God. Those are Jesus' words. If I go back to Christina Kuzmik's story, her life obviously didn't end on the kitchen floor that day because I was listening to her podcast many, many years after that. She didn't take her life. In fact, she said after that moment, she had that thought, like, what if I just ended it right now? And my, my daughters would end up somewhere better. They wouldn't end up with this broken mom that's just not doing well. And she said, after, right after she had that thought, something inside of her woke up, her words, something just woke up inside of me. And then she realized that no matter how bad things are, no matter what little she thought she had to offer, she has worth. And she wanted that message to be the message that she is known for which is what changed inside of her. That that worth that she received from knowing and following God, that was the worth that she wanted to give people, the hope that comes with finding contentment when we pursue God. So she writes books and creates this content pointing back to what God can do. She embraced the fact that she had pain she turned her pain into purpose. That's a very hard thing to do. I know. I know it's hard to say, God, I don't know why I'm going through this right now. But I know that you're not going to leave me through this process. That maybe one day I can use this pain to help someone else. That's hard.
hard place to be in, I know. But what if God's calling you to do that right now? Your world changes when you begin to live for God. It does. You find a different purpose when you begin to live for God because your life does not focus on what you're doing today or tomorrow. It starts focusing on what you can do for God for eternity and it changes everything. But it requires a decision that we have to make. God gives us a decision to choose him or not. He doesn't force us. He lets us choose. We're rolling into the fall months here. I know we have super awesome fall weather today. I planned it that way for you guys. I was like, God, can you make it cloudy and you know gloomy like it would be for fall? That'd be awesome. But we're rolling into the fall months. Life's gonna get busy. School starts for Lake Stevens District this week. For some of you in other districts, you started last week, but school is starting, sports are starting, extracurricular activities are beginning, the holidays are coming. I went to Costco last month in August. Christmas is everywhere. Holidays are coming, and when holidays come, Thanksgiving, Christmas, typically what ends up happening is we start thinking, holy cow, where did the year go? Or we start thinking about the things that we don't have, family members that we have lost or that are no longer in our lives. And we fall into the holiday depression. All of those things can sneak up on you. So what I want to do is I want to try to bring focus back to God before the madness begins. The band's going to come back up here, and we're going to do one more song. But I just want to pray, and I just want, I want, to, I want to realign ourselves. I want us to focus on what God can do with you right now, whether you're in the middle of the struggle, whether you're in the middle of the pain, whether you've come out of the pain, or whether you're about to experience pain. I want us to focus on what God can do through you. Because even if you're struggling, God can still use you to reach someone else that's struggling. It's happened in my own life where I've had people that are broken, struggling, hurting, that has come alongside of me when I was broken, hugged, struggling. And they did it because they wanted God to use them. Why not you? Let me pray for you. Father, right now as we get ready to roll into the fall months, Lord, the last quarter always seems to go by so quickly, so fast with school and sports and holidays and everything else in between, the weather changes, the flu seasons, all of that just, it seems to just speed up everything. And I just pray right now that we don't lose focus. God, that we realize that you are with us, that you promise peace. And I just pray that no matter where we're at, whether we're in the middle of the struggle, whether we've just come out of it, I just pray for a preparation in our heart. I pray for comfort. I pray for obedience and persistence. I pray that we remember that we have value, that you are with us. And so I pray that we just bring that focus to you right now in this moment and that we dedicate this fall, Father, to being an instrument, to being a hand that can be on someone's shoulder that needs it. Someone that can listen, that can offer encouragement. I pray that that is us. I'm so grateful, God. I'm so grateful that you've sent people in my life when I have struggled. I pray that we can be that for others. Prepare us, Father, for those moments this fall. In Jesus' name, amen. starts changing Oh, I'm gonna worship till I mean every word Cause the way I feel and the fear I'm facing doesn't change who you are or what you deserve I give you my worship
out your praises in blessing and breaking you worthy you worthy you worthy of my soul you worthy of it all I'm gonna live like my king to my soul that you've already won and even though I can't see you into our lives, Lord. We ask that you'd be with us this week. Lord, move through the pain, move through the blessing. You're worthy of it all, Lord. So we give ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we hope you guys have an amazing week. God bless you. We'll see you next week. If you would feel free to help us.